All right, everybody, welcome to the March meetup for the Leptos community. My name is Luke, and I'm super happy to be hosting for you this month. Um, Diversable is out this month, so I'm kind of just stepping in. And um, yeah, so first up, we've got a we've got Greg who's going to give us some updates on 0 0.7 as well as GTK demo. Afterwards, we've got Ben who's going to be discussing 0 0.7 release and his time at Rust Nation UK. Then we've got an ecosystem, a library update, uh, Tailwind Fuse with Nico. <clears throat> and in the middle of that, we're gonna actually be hosting um, Ken from Code to the Moon on YouTube. He's gonna give us a brief intro and a bio. He's gonna be discussing why Leptos and why he chose it to um, use for his new course, which he's dropping soon. And we're happy to have him on so he can uh, make that announcement. So um, Greg, I'll go ahead and bring you up now. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, man. Good. Very good. So yeah, it's tell us about 0 0.7. So what's up? Yeah. So um, uh, some of you who will be watching know that uh, Ben was at Rust Nation this week. Ben actually is in uh, in the UK still at Rust Nation. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more about that from him later. But so I actually spent a lot of my last um, month's worth or so of working on Leptos, working on porting his blog demo over to 0 0.7 so we could do some 0 0.6 versus 0 0.7 comparisons. Uh, and in reality, porting his blog over to 0 0.7 meant me going in and implementing all the stuff that I hadn't actually done yet in that new version um, and getting it closer to being working for real apps instead of just kind of exploring and doing demo stuff. Um, and so I was sort of just going through and, and building out a lot of the stuff that we needed to convert a normal website like his blog, which has, um, you know, auth and which has a kind of admin panel and as well as the actual content of the blog. Um, it's interesting. I think my experience of doing that has been that um, 0 0.7 has been a long time coming. And the goal is basically the framework that you already have, but better in every way. And so if, if we eventually release it and there are only one or two things that seem like new features or big changes, uh, I'll be pretty excited by that. Like, I, I don't think it should feel like a big change to people, except that um, everything ends up being better. Like we saw his kind of WASM binary size go from like 900 kilobytes down to 750. The HTML, HTML output is shorter, so it's less bandwidth for users. Uh, the HTML output is faster. There should be lower memory use, both in the browser and on the server. Um, and we uh, took away some of the, the awkward things about the Axum integration that relate to like having this unsend, unsync, not thread safe reactive system that was built for the browser and trying to do server stuff with it. Um, so there are a lot of improvements that are all kind of um, rebuilding a lot of the core of the library. So the work I've been doing now the last month or so has kind of required rebuilding a lot of the um, the core ecosystem, like the meta data package and the router around those new primitives, um, but in a way that hopefully users won't actually notice a lot of those changes that are going on. Um, and the point of that is there's a little bit of like, oh, it could be done better and a little bit of looking at the code base and thinking like, oh, well, what if we did this? What if we did that? Um, really, there are just a bunch of problems that we need to solve. and. Uh, ultimately, I'm kind of taking the time to try to solve as many of those problems along the way as we can. Um, so I would say, you know, I would expect by like the end of April, we should have some kind of an alpha version for people to be trying out and figuring out kind of what's um, what needs to change or what doesn't work about the new APIs. Um, I feel like I keep discovering new uh, opportunities and new things to think about. Um, and so I'm trying to just like take the time to actually work on stuff. And we have a great working version in 0 0.6, you know, so it's not a huge rush. Um, one of the big um, points though, is not just like making it better code or making the library better, um, but actually that making some of these internal changes will unlock a lot of future features for us. Um, and so there's, you know, one small change like making the reactive system thread safe, right? If you're working just in the browser with browser UI, that's not as big of a deal, but if you want to use it in other situations, like people sometimes explore, you know, oh, I want Leptos, but to build a terminal app, or oh, I want Leptos for native UI, um, you do need the, the thread safety piece of it. Um, and then the other thing has just been kind of going from this big, the, the renderer being very tied to the DOM, being very tied to the web sys package for the browser, um, and, you know, just 
being very, very focused on web framework and and kind of breaking things down out of this big, um, you know, DOM manipulation code spread all over the place into this smaller, uh, more trait based system where we can then just kind of compose the behavior of how you render something. And that's really good because it's what's unlocked a lot of the binary size uh, reductions because the compiler can do a lot better dead code elimination when we're doing these trait implementations and stuff rather than a big enumerated type that you're just sending around all over the place, which is what the view currently is. Um, but the other thing that doing a, a trait based kind of rendering system lets us do is actually make all of the um, view update and view rendering code um, independent of the actual renderer and almost like generic over it. So in other words, um, right now we have a, a framework with a reactive system and then a, a kind of rendering system that's very tied to the DOM. Um, but in the process of trying to clean that DOM rendering code up a little bit, trying to you know extract some of the common functions, um, it became pretty clear that we can actually build a kind of universal rendering or more generic rendering system. Um, so you can actually do things like use Leptos to write a desktop UI um, and run actual native UI code. Um, and if that's not your thing at all, right, which for some people, that's really exciting. For some people, they're like, no, I just build web, web applications. Uh, this is also the exact same approach that something like the solid 3JS library takes to do 3D rendering with solid JS. Solid has a similar kind of universal rendering type. And then they just, instead of rendering to the DOM, it renders to the 3D shapes in the, in the canvas. Um, so I thought I would just give a little demo today of uh, how the GTK kind of experimental integration I've been working with works. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, GTK is uh, basically a, um, you know, it's an open source uh, uh, UI toolkit. It's what like the GNOME desktop environment um, on Linux is, is built on. Um, and it is really common for building, building desktop applications. It runs across platforms. Um, there's like, there are a few Rust libraries that you can use with it. I don't find any of them super ergonomic. Um, so I thought, hey, what, what if we could kind of use Leptos to do that instead? Um, I hope this is big enough for people. I, I tried to make it a pretty good size. Um, I think so this looks, looks like, yeah. yeah, okay, cool. This looks like pretty typical like Leptos code, right? Like we've got a, a read write signal, we've got two of them. We've got an effect, you know, you're seeing some of here too, just the, the kind of rustier names for things like effect new and RW signal new. Um, and then I've got this sort of vertical stack, horizontal stack. Okay, we've got a, a button that does a, you know, a minus one, a button to do a plus one. Fine, this this all looks hopefully fairly um, straightforward to people. It's not using like the view macro that we would use, but it's using a, a kind of builder pattern function call. And, you know, the button function is just um, a button. It's got all this stuff that doesn't look at all like the HTML or the DOM stuff that we that we have. So. This is kind of the way that GTK works. Instead of you know an on handler, you have like a connect clicked. Um, but we do the same thing. This is just a kind of button function. Okay, so I thought I would just you know run the uh, what on earth? That's weird. Okay, we're just gonna do this instead. Um, Yeah, you know, so here's our our little UI. Um, probably quite small. I don't know GTK stuff at, at all, so I don't even know like how to make this window bigger normally. Um, but you know, you click the button, the counter goes up. Um, you click the swap thing, the numbers two and four swap. Um, what's cool about that piece, right, is that uh, this code is actually using. Um, man uses vim okay um it's actually using the four component and like this is the exact same four component that you would use in the dom to do a list of elements and instead um you know it's just generic over the back end that we're using to render um so you can create something where you know you've got these callbacks that are updating signals they're updating values you know you've got a list and so you're writing in a very similar style where it's this declarative code you know, you don't have to be building up the, the tree, you know, manually like you would if you were just using raw GTK stuff and it's using the whole rendering system signals, whatever. Um, so like that's kind of that's kind of cool. Um, you can also just go ahead and do things using normal Rust native code. 
So if we wanted to just um, spawn a thread, like this is an actual system thread that loops and it's just sleeps for a quarter of a second and then updates the signal. Um, and if we run that, you'll see it just loops and updates a signal from the other thread. Um, and this is something we haven't been able to do before at all, sending a signal from one thread to another thread, running some effect in the first thread, like printing it, like updating that. Um, so this is great because this is something that the, the new reactive system in 0 0.7 lets us do with, with native code. This is again, just like a plain Rust binary, right? There's nothing having to do with the web going on here. Um, and you can just use the reactive system to drive a, a native application, uh, which is great. Um, so that's all like kind of cool. People ask sometimes with these things, oh, so are you talking about how does this interact with the web stuff? Like, are you rendering GTK in the browser? Like, no, this is just purely using the same kind of a system to let you write native applications. Um, however, right, if you notice, like instead of impl into view here, right, this is impl render generic over this leptos GTK uh, struct and all that that type is, is it's just an empty struct and then it implements um, a renderer trait. And this renderer trait has a few functions like you can create a text node, you can create a placeholder, you can set the text, you know, you can set some property. GTK works a lot like the DOM, so there are like objects, um, there's a whole tree of inheritance, you know, different types of widgets and you set properties on them and so on. So it's a lot like setting attributes on a, on a HTML element or something. Um, and so people ask like, okay, well, can I use this to share code between a web version of an app and a native version of an app? Um, and because it's just generic over this, you actually kind of can. So this is not something to be clear that I have actually built out. Um, the idea here is just to sort of show, here's the sort of thing that this unlocks for us. Um, and so if we go in, um, you see, I sort of uh, uh, took this render type and gated it on a, a WASM feature or a GTK feature, right? Which, you know, we all love our config flags there. Um, and then in the actual body of this application, which is, you know, you create the value, you create the rows, you have the effect that logs out the value. Um, you have the same UI with the vertical stack, the horizontal stack, the button. This is literally the same application code. Um, and then what I did was I just, took these functions that we're using that we're creating the actual buttons and made it um, use this render type instead of a particular renderer and then kind of gated it. So we say, okay, a button, well, if we're in GTK mode, it's going to be this GTK button. It, when it, you click it, it does, it calls the callback. And when you're in DOM mode, it's going to be an, just an HTML element button. When you click it, it calls the callback um, and it has the label that you gave it and so on. And same thing with these um, vertical and horizontal stacks. That's just like a, div with display, you know, flex or whatever. Um, and so you can kind of almost build a design system that share where you have components that are sort of dumb components. They take a callback, they take some content, they render something across the two different platforms, but the actual behavior of the application is exactly the same. Um, and again, like, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not that interesting. It's the same GTK application. And you see, we're updating the thing. I made them uh, horizontal here for a reason. I'll, you know, you'll see in a second. Um, so we've got the GTK version, right? Um, and I don't want you in Firefox. And if we just do the trunk serve on the WASM version, You can see that we've got the same application. And these are not like sharing any information, right? These are two totally different applications, but they both have the same functionality, um, but sharing the kind of logic of them and then just shelling out to this design system. Um, so like, that's kind of fun. And if you set it up with something like Cargo Watch, then uh, you can actually start working on things and this is just a sort of silly demo but it's just kind of to show the power of the the generic part of this so let's say we want to add another button and now we've got um you know cargo watch running for the gtk version and we've got trunk running for for the web version uh, and let's say we add another button that says like add a 
add a row and items items dot push items dot len. So just add another add another one to the end. And now we've got adding another row and adding another row. So we're like working on the same the same application here, right? Um, one of the other funny things that I hadn't really thought that much about, but it turns out to be true, um, GTK lets you do styling with um, CSS. And so we can actually go into a CSS file and say something like, Um, and now I've got the CSS file in trunks. So we've got red bold buttons here and we've also got it in GTK. And right away when we updated the same application, they both just relaunched. Um, you know, you don't need to do anything in either of them recompiling the CSS. So you've pretty much instantly got, uh, you know, these, oh, that's interesting, right? So they don't support all the same CSS things. Fair enough. Um, but, you know, so this is just working on the same application, two different platforms. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I genuinely don't know. Like, this is something I'm just playing around with, honestly, to have fun in a way, because um, I wanted a break after building up lots of um, building up and porting. And there's a lot of maintenance work that comes right. Um, but the exploring this stuff, I think, is is kind of cool just to see, like, what can we do? Um, because there are approaches where you can use a web view to build a desktop application, and that's great. Um, but what if a component library said, okay, here's a minimal set of components that we've defined for a couple native platforms and for, you know, a web component library or something. Um, and then you can build applications that run on all the different platforms. So anyway, just thought that was fun to, to share with folks um, in the midst of saying, yes, I am, I am making commits and slowly upgrading everything to 0 0.7. But here's the fun stuff that this won't be in 0 0.7.0. .0 but maybe with 0 0.7.1 or 2 or 3, someone will be able to build Leptos native, build Leptos GTK, because now we're putting in the machinery that people need to build something like that out. Man, that is super awesome. So yeah, you kind of kind of not just think about 0 0.7, but even beyond that and kind of be one or two, three steps ahead. Is that right? Yeah, and I think the goal is kind of, right. like I said earlier, I don't think there will be any big new blockbuster features in 0 0.7. I think the goal is to make it so that we can build those hopefully in patch releases in 0 0.7 because the you know minor releases is always a little bit of churn for ecosystem libraries and stuff, but just to lay the groundwork to be able to build some really cool stuff on top. Um, and there will be more like the 0 0.7 stuff is um, kind of laying the groundwork again for better islands and things too, I hope, um, and better, you know, just, I don't know, it's it's sort of, we needed to reset the baseline of where things are to a better level, I think. Sure, sure. I think it was the last one you, the last meetup last month, you were you were talking about how, I think it was 0, 0.0 to 0 0.1 was kind of a paradigm shift. And then was it, was it into 0 0.6 or were you saying that 0 0.7 is kind of a big paradigm shift? Yeah, um, right. So 0, 0.0 to 0 0.1 was a huge change. and things are basically the same as they have been since then. Like there were small things that needed to change that we needed to do minor version releases. And there have been big changes like removing all the CX scope, CX comma everywhere, yeah. reactive system stuff. I remember that. But that, that didn't act, that wasn't actually like a, that didn't really change the renderer. That was like a, that was like a tweak that had really nice downstream implications. And this is like a, okay, fundamentally knowing what we know now, starting starting from the beginning and replacing the engine of the thing, um, what do you get? So it is, it is, and that'll be 0, 0 0.7, right? That's like the, the stuff that I've, and I've kind of been working on this for six months while we do other things too. But 0 0.6 was the big sure. like server function uh, release and 0 0.7 will be this. That's awesome. Uh, we do have uh, a couple of questions or at least one question. So the first one um, is, is there any interest in building this with one of the Rust um, GUI frameworks? And if so, which one? Well, so the awesome thing is that, um, 
what would be a good analogy? This is like um, if you trained a robot to drive a car and then you ask the question, do you have any interest in doing this with an electric car? And it's like, sure. Once the robot knows how to drive a car, it can adjust to driving an electric car pretty quick, right? So what, what we're building is a thing that can drive UI frameworks. Like most UI frameworks are, here's a widget. Tell me when I need to update something about the widget. Um, tell me when the widget fires an event. So this like rendering system knows how to take a bunch of imperative code to create widgets and update widgets and let you write declarative code. Just like, um, you know, it's, it's Leptos sits in the area where it's right now it's driving like vanilla JavaScript DOM manipulation. And it can also drive GTK manipulation or Qt or a Rust framework. I mean, honestly, a lot of the Rust frameworks aren't built like um, the traditional retained mode, like object oriented um, UI toolkits are. And Leptos is really designed for the DOM. So it tends to work really well with things like 90s era object oriented UI toolkits like GTK, like I'm sure, um, you know, some other ones fall into that category. A lot of the Rust ones, they come with their own like stateful type solutions now. Um, so I don't know whether there are some of them would work really well with or not, but it would definitely be um, pretty cool to explore. And the idea is that you should be able to build like the render trait is about 10 methods. So if you can implement those 10 methods for any UI framework, then you can use this to drive that UI framework. Awesome. Um, we have another question. Uh, were you inspired? Is this inspired by Dioxus? Do you feel as though we're kind of moving in that direction? And I actually, I was maybe a little, I, I didn't want to ask that. <laughs> but when yeah. we were watching the GTK demo, or you, you had mentioned something and, and that had like crossed my mind. So, but somebody else asked this. So, um, yeah, do you feel like we're kind of moving in that direction? Kind of a, a Dioxus sort of cross platform? I think they're kind of cross platform native or something like this. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I think that um, what they do is really cool and not quite like this, right? What they do is let you write um, wet, like using web view UI, but all of the logic is in the native Rust binary side of it when you're doing the desktop stuff. And that's really cool. And I mean, one of the things that, one of the real similarities I think is that Rust is a really good language. I mean, Rust for the web, like I love it because I love the Rust language and I find it really productive, um, but it's not a natural fit. Rust for a desktop application is a really natural fit. Like you can use the whole standard library, you can use threads, you can actually do the stuff that the language is kind of built for. Um, and I think in that way, there's a real similarity where Dioxys is like, yes, Rust is a really good library for application code. Um, this is like, one of the things I have fun with about this is like, hey, I can spawn a thread and send something. And the browser is so built on this single threaded, not, nothing can block model. It's, it just feels a little different. Um, but I would say that um, you can build something that's like Dioxys using this kind of generic rendering system. Um, I don't think that, I, I would never say that this is like a replacement for what Dioxys is trying to do. And I don't even think they're in competition. I would say that this is like one great outcome could be somebody uses this to build the best Rust GTK solution instead of just using raw GTK or the one or two other libraries there are. Or somebody um, somebody uses it to build something that's like Dioxys where it could send these um, messages about how to update the DOM over. I'm not sure if that is okay. Um, okay, it's not me. It is Greg's video stream that is frozen. So okay. Um, then what I'm going to do, Ben, I'm going to go ahead and bring you in. Um, all right, so we're going to call an audible until we get Greg back here. How are you doing, Ben? I'm doing pretty good. It's been a myself, really. But... Oh my god. Uh, I think we've got Greg back now. 
hey, yeah, did you lose me for a second? I was just still talking and talking. I didn't know who was down. So, um, yeah, yeah I, I, I wasn't sure I, either. I don't yeah. know where I don't know where you lost me. I think that Dioxys is doing awesome, awesome work. I think there's some overlap here. I think the last thing I was just saying that I'll, I'll just say and, and maybe close and we can go to Ben. Um, one of the things I love about the Rust world is that people tend to end up with a set of small libraries that work well together. And one of the things I've been really intentional about in this rewrite is trying to spin out as much of the framework as possible into smaller libraries that don't depend on each other so that you can reuse some of this stuff to um, in other frameworks, or you can reuse this stuff with no framework um, and almost like breaking down the framework big monolith into smaller crates so that there are more opportunities for collaboration and cooperation. Like I think the server function thing that we've shared with the Axis has been so great because that's like a framework independent, anyone can use it. It's just a Rust library. And I think the more things in the ecosystem we have that are just a Rust library um, that you can use here or you can use there is, is really awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us, Greg. Um, I think we can jump over to Ben then. Go for it. It was so nice to be with you all. I hope you have a great afternoon. All right. Likewise, Greg. Thanks for joining. Take care. All right, Ben, it looks like you're muted. Um, I think I can unmute you. I know. I think you need to. There you go. I I, I should be unmuted now. Now yeah. I have some new things we to have, think we have about. Some... <laughs> yeah, well, we have, some, we, have, we have someone in the chat. Um, commenting on the amazing London skyline. So for those tuning in, uh, Ben is actually our our uh, London-based correspondent this month. Uh, he's there for Rust Nation UK. Um, so uh, yeah, how was, uh, how was Rust Nation? And, and, and tell us all about it. And, and I think you have some exciting updates for us for 0 0.7. And I think you were actually going to comment on, on something that Greg had just mentioned as well, that you've got some new things to think about. So I'll just pass it over to you. Sure. I mean, it's been a busy week for me. I flew in for Rust Nation, uh, primarily to talk about Leptos in in Europe, right? And it, I mean, I've I've learned a lot, and it's been it's been so much fun to meet so many new people and so many people from the community. Um, as far as Greg's stuff goes, it certainly makes me want to do things like implement a TUI framework and and think and think about that a little bit. So um, it's exciting, I think, for that. Um, I think some people that, have already been working on that, no? I think so. I don't know what stage they're at. I haven't seen much activity recently. So maybe. Yeah, they, they were working right. on it several, several months ago. Yeah, I know several months ago, but I hadn't seen any activity recently. It sounds like it should be easier with the new version. So excuse me. Um, but yeah, it was fun. We met a lot of interesting people. There are a surprising number of Leptos apps, you know, in production and people that have heard of it. You know, when I asked, you know, the room, how many people had used and tried Leptos, you know, it was roughly, I want to say like 40, 50% of them. And that's, that's really shocking to me. Um, uh, we've come a, a long way. A total, how many, to how many people were in the audience? About 60, I think, 60, 80, wow, okay. somewhere around there, um, which is really exciting for me. Um, besides that, you know, they gave me a Leptos plushie, which I've always wanted. So I'm excited about that. Um, <laughs> nice. But I thought, I thought it would be nice since the streaming of my talk was basically not working. Um, that I could do the last bit of it, where I talk about um, um, where I talk about why you might want to use Leptos and some of the findings we've found, and I've kind of been doing some work in that area, uh, prepping for this. So, um, if you're up for it, of course. Absolutely, let's do it. All right, let me see. And by the way, for anybody listening and watching, if you have questions, don't forget to put them in the chat. You can either, if you're in the Discord server, um, put them in the Discord server, or you can put them in the YouTube chat. 
uh, I will put a ticker up right now um, to join the watch party on Discord. The link is in the YouTube description. So join the Discord server, join the watch party, uh, and feel free to ask questions in the YouTube chat or on Discord. All right, take it away, Ben. All right, I'm going to make this full screen, I think, because that's easier for you guys, even though I can no longer see myself. It'll be fine. Um, so basically, the point of my talk at Rust Nation is that I believe at this point that Leptos is a viable alternative to one of the JS frameworks for the majority of sites that people are building. And I think that's a pretty radical concept you know, in, in the community. And I, I feel like, you know, kind of have to make the case for it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those are the two goals, right? The first half of it, I basically introduce signals and fine grain reactivity. And then I do like a basic tutorial code demo. And I think we can probably skip that because I think most of you have done the basic code leptos thing. Um, so we'll go right to, nope, ah. okay. So this is about the point where I pivot, right? From teaching to evangelizing, I suppose. Um, all of these things I've heard about Rust web frameworks, you know, since I started a year ago up to now, you know, the bundle size is too large. The startup time is too slow. We need, it doesn't have direct access to the DOM and it needs it and the compiling takes too long. And it's been really fascinating because none of these things are really true anymore. I mean, the compiling time one is a little bit true, but the rest of these, I don't think um, qualify. So one of the things Greg helped me do, um, right? He said that he converted it, um, my app to Leptos 0.7 uh, but he also threw it into the JS framework benchmark, the really famous benchmark that all the frameworks are in, right? So we can kind of put some numbers on the difference between 0.7 and 0.6 right now, right? And you could kind of see that in the columns there. I can't tell if that's too small for you. It was too small for them, but can anyone see that? I'm going to assume no. Um, but you can kind of see there's I a nice little, a oh, you can see it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can see it, but you have to look, look close, but you can see it. Right. You can kind of see there's a nice little bump. Uh, this one's duration. So how long it took to run these, but there's a nice little increase in duration between Leptos 0.6 and 0.7. Um, he also experimented with a sledgehammer version of Leptos 0.7, which is what Dioxus uses to batch JS calls to the DOM. And you can kind of see that that's a little bit faster than the default 0.7. But and you'll see in the rest of the slides that uh, you lose in bundle size and memory. So I think we're not going to be doing that right now. But as far as the rendering goes, you could pretty easily take our signals front end that Greg introduced and plug that into Sledgehammer yourself if that what you wanted to do, right? Um, so as far as those myths, as far as those myths go, right? Leptos is pretty far to the left. React, Angular, and Vue are all somewhat slower than Leptos in this test. Svelte, Solid, and regular JS all beat us a little bit, which is to be expected. We didn't add Dioxus to this one, but Dioxus is also a little bit ahead of us because they're using that sledgehammer and they're doing some neat tricks. Um, so that's pretty neat, right? Um, so before my talk, I talked to a variety of Leptos users that were building commercial or commercial-ish sites with Leptos. Um, the top one is Patter, which is uh, Rekshish's um, Kubernetes platform. He built the control interface and the marketing page with Leptos. Um, you can take a look at that in a little bit. The California Beach Volleyball Association, it's a fun site. 
Um, they also did it. And then Chris, right, rewrote his whole video platform in, um, in, in Rust and Leptos. And one of the things I wanted to get from them is a little bit of user research. Um, but before I talk about the user research, um, I did a little performance benchmarking of my own, right? So I took my blog, and if you and if any of you have followed my blog for long enough, and I'd be surprised if you did, um, it started off on Remix, and then I rewrote it in um, the various versions of Leptos, and now it's currently on Leptos with Spin, just so I can make sure things work the way we expect it. Um, so we basically, I thought, you know, what's a good way to test how much it can handle? So I took the um, the two versions, the Remix version and the base Leptos version that runs Axum, and I measured how long it took to load a page with Vegeta, the load page analyzer thing. And then you just dump more and more requests onto it. You stress it out, right? So zero requests per second, 100 requests per second, et cetera. And I've tried to make these things as close, as similar as I can. You know, they've got, both got SQLite for post fetching. They both have the same HTML, CSS. You know, all of that fun things. And then I stuck it on Digital Digital Ocean and some dedicated AMD vCPUs. Always fun. So this was the Remix version that I tested. Um, this is a really fun graph. Like I really like this graph, and I've never seen one before. Um, the left y-axis is the latency in milliseconds. The bottom is requests per second. The heat map determines how likely it was to be at that frequency. Um, and then at the top, you can kind of see um, the success rate. And all of these lines line up between the different sections, right? And you can kind of see in Leptos that, or not in Leptos, in Remix, that right around 100 requests per second your latency spikes really far up. Um, and then shortly after that, you start failing. And then there, you've got this whole bottom here where I think it just basically didn't work at all. And I could probably chop that out, right? Um, but the interesting comparison is to Leptos, right? So this one, about 100 requests per second before the latency spike, you know, about, I'm gonna say 200, 300 requests before it starts, requests per second before it starts failing. And then if you look at Leptos, right, the version that I built and did absolutely no performance optimizations on, um, you can kind of see that it's stable all the way up to roughly 1,000 requests per second, right? And if you can tolerate a little bit of um, a little bit of weirdness, you can go a little bit farther than that. But the reason that that's significant, right, is that you can handle somewhere between three and 10x more traffic with the same server, you know, which is a massive reduction in infra costs for companies that, you know, care about infra costs. And web developers, I also care about inf infra costs. I think it's getting more expensive these days. So I think it's pretty easy to make a performance case here. The other thing you kind of noticed that I thought was really cool and um, is that Greg pointed this out to me is that this kind of starts at 20 milliseconds for the JS one, but you can kind of see the effect of the of the JIT, right? The JavaScript compiler as it starts to optimize it because it actually decreases a little bit all the way up until it's like implodes, right? And I just thought that was fascinating. The Leptos one, you can kind of see, stays about half the time for the Remix one, roughly the entire time, although it does kind of get smaller. The trick here is the latency. Y-axis is not the same. This is 1 in 10, and this is 10 in 100, right? So this is a much smaller difference. Um, these are the takeaways, right? 50% reduction in page load. We, talk, we talked about the in reduced infra costs. Um, another reason you might choose Leptos that I talked about a little bit is, you know, the server functions, how you can share the client. Uh, you can share your server backend types to your front end. You have those types at compile time and run time. And you've got a pretty stable set of tools in Cargo, Cargo Leptos, and Rust format. You know, the JS ecosystem is certainly improving. 
and there's a lot of different choices out there right now. Um, a lot of those tools are being rewritten in Rust to make them faster. And usually there's one or two people attempting that. So uh, it's an interesting space for them. It makes me wonder a little bit how we got to this point as web developers. You know, it feels like it's our fault. Like we did this to ourselves for the most part. And that's a little distressing, I think. The other thing, so if you remember, I talked a bit about the surveys, right? The other thing I got from the surveys that I thought was interesting was the developer time, right? I found people telling me that the more work that the tooling does, the less the programmer needs to keep things in their head. Basically, they were able to build Leptos things with more effort, sorry, less effort and less resources than they were able to build a similar app, right? And I think that's a pretty big benefit that people don't talk about very much. I got some quotes, right, um, from a few members of our community. This this one's Rakshish, which I'm sure you've met in one of the previous ones. And if not, he's, he's pretty friendly. Um, and I think basically the gist of this one is that the slightly increased time to iterate, right? The compile times take a little bit longer. You have to handle a little bit more types. Is was more than offset for his application by the reduction in bugs. And um, so he he he's very happy with it, right? Uh, Chris, who's probably in the audience and here I don't think I've showed him this before I before I put it on here, but we did talk about it, right? So um, he basically says the similar thing that he enjoyed building it and that it was easier for him to build it compared to his previous version, um, which, you know, is a pretty good indicator, I think. And then we have Alex from the Cal who made the California Beach Volleyball Association site. I think it'd be kind of cool to have a card that says I'm part of the California Beach Volleyball Association. I'm not sure what I'd do with it, but he talks about the performances as well. Um, you you all get a shout out, right? The Leptos Discord and all of the library maintainers have done amazing work. Um, I started out you know, really early in the cycle, like one and a half months after Greg published the first version on Crates.io. And back then it was pretty bare. And I'm, I'm so happy to have more options here. Um, we already talked a bit about Leptos 0.7. This is just a more confined version of this. Um, we talked about it in the last meetup, but not really in this one, that we're going to be kind of improving the way that async happens. Um, but I think that's a little bit in flux, and you should check out what Greg said last time. Um, so that's kind of the reasons that I gave for why you might want to use Leptos across your stack. Server functions are great, right? They make setting up a REST API super easy. Performance, infra costs, Rust tooling, and as I said, the lower complexity. And that's basically the back end of the talk that I gave at Rust Nation UK. Um, and it's been really amazing hearing from so many people here that have used Leptos, and I've been trying to get somebody to tell me a negative thing. You know, I was like, "Is that? Do you have any difficulties? You know, can we improve something?" And mostly, I didn't get any of that. The only thing I got was that it's kind of hard to use Tonic um, with Leptos, which I think is fair because they're kind of doing different but similar things, and you have to merge them, right? Um, besides uh, this, right, uh, I should announce that I am building the Leptos Pavex integration. If you know Pavex, it is Luca Palmieri's um, new Rust backend server with a focus on better error messages and ergonomics and having everything built in kind of like Ruby on Rails. So that's pretty exciting. I also reached out to the Fastly people um, and there's a pretty good chance I'll be building one for Fastly too to run Leptos on their Edge platform. So all that stuff, fun stuff, should be in the works soon. And yeah, I had Leptos stickers. I still have some, but a lot of them went away. 
I can't, obviously can't send them to you because I'm in London, but you know, and yeah, that was my talk. I would love, yeah, I, if any of you have yeah, questions, anybody, you know, I'm more than happy to answer them. Otherwise we can keep this train yeah, rolling. Anybody, yeah, totally. Uh, if anybody has any questions, be sure to post them in the live chat or the discord server. Um, yeah, that, that is super exciting. I mean, anybody who spends any, any amount of time on like development, development, Twitter or development X, I don't know what we, what we call it these days, but you know, anybody that spends any amount of time there will invariably at some, at some point in time, come across, you know, a server cost thread. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's huge. Um, three to 10 times more. Um, so uh were you sharing rakshi's site yeah i thought i'd run through whoops no autoplay i thought i'd run through um a couple of the sites that i talked about right i did this at the talk right this is rakshi's site patter you know it's it's pretty decent it's it's got modern it's got all the things you would expect on some startups uh landing page right the california beach volleyball association it's also pretty snazzy. Let's see if it loads here. I am pretty far from California, assuming that's where it's hosted. Uh, or maybe my internet will just die. I was literally okay. just on their site, so I know their site's working. I, I looked at them. There we go. There we I go. It's just download. poor. Hotel Wi Fi. Yeah. Um, so I won't make you look at the slowly loading picture. But, you know, it's a nice site, right? And then obviously, uh, Rust Adventure from Chris Biscardi is beautiful. So, lovely site. Um, lots of nice work there. And Housekeep. Oh, well, yeah. Housekeep as well. Yeah, yeah I wanted uh, to housekeep. put in Housekeep, but from like Monday through Thursday, no, Monday through Wednesday, or maybe Monday through late Tuesday night, or Sunday through Tuesday night, when I was working on the talk, Husky had an expired certificate uh, and didn't work. But yeah, I think it's back up now. So Husky has a lovely site. I can go look at properties. Like I guess that one. It is insanely fast. <clears throat> right? And he's got a giant database of properties with pictures and analytics and all that stuff. It's really impressive how fast the site actually is. So yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, besides these commercial options, I saw somebody use Leptos to build a fully functional Notion clone basically, which was really fascinating. The interesting crux team at Red Badger. It's kind of this tool that lets you encapsulate your business logic, uh, supports Leptos as a front end option, which is always fun. And I think those are the big ones that uh, people showed me. So um, really happy to see people taking it and building lovely things. Yeah, yeah, Greg points out the house keys. He's running that in a server in his house too, just a single server in his house, <laughs> and it's that fast. <laughs> um so let me let me zoom out just a little bit then so just if we were to kind of just take the take the temperature of of how leptos was received at at rust nation uk maybe maybe it's a little bit of a two-part question so we could we could maybe say first um you know what is the general level of interest for you know web development frameworks and, and libraries and things like this so kind of that whole that whole ecosystem what's the level of interest there and then and zooming in a little bit more specifically, Leptos, what, how, what was the reception there and, and the level of interest there if we were to kind of just take the temperature for those two? So um, I think both of the talks were quite, um, people were excited about. It's kind of hard to get a sense of it, but Ernest, the, one of the organizers of Rust Nation, was telling me that this was one of the most popular topics he had heard about. And Ernest also works for the Rust Foundation. And he mentioned that they were 
excited about trying to promote Leptos and Rust as a front-end web option. We are one of the only, I mean, we're the only open source one. Well, I shouldn't say open source. We're the only non-commercial one right now. We have a lot more flexible backend. Um, and overall, it, it just seemed excited. So many people came up to me and told me that they tried it and they enjoyed it and they wish they could use it more. Um, so I, I, I think it's very positive. If you were to say, did anybody give you any reasons as to why they can't use it more? Is it just because they're already working in a stack that's already committed and, you know, with with some sort of, is, is that generally the, I think it's the sort of thing where you just need time for it to kind of propagate, you know, into the, out into the world before there's people working on it. It's just a function think, of time, I guess, maybe. Yeah. I think there's some room for us to define a good story for, excuse me, running Letos alongside some other framework, excuse me. Like um, when I was in the Remix community before I joined the Leptos community, one of the things that they had was that React Router was used by a lot more sites than Remix, but it was easy to combine React Router and Remix um, routes into one app and kind of iterate, you know, iteratively change to Remix. And I think it would be nice if we could figure out a way to make that process flexible um, for JS to Leptos. And admittedly, that is a harder challenge or PHP to Leptos or Python to Leptos. But I think we could probably figure out some way of doing that uh, that simplifies that a little bit. Um, most of the people I talked to, yeah, they they were working on some giant pre-existing TypeScript or Python stack. So I think for them, we'd have to make a case that the that the switch is worthwhile. And I think it would be easier to make that case if they could do that iteratively. So. Yeah. Yeah, because you're asking you're asking people to take on, to, to take on, I don't know, this is just kind of a recurring theme that I, that I see kind of in the business world um, is that so many people, particularly in the context of, a, of an organization, um, to ask them to take on risk, that's a big ask. Um, particularly when it's something like 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 a stack upon which the the very product and the revenue depends. Mm -hmm. um, so that's got to be a very very compelling case to be made if you're going to ask them to take on a risk like that. And and right. the, to the extent that you can de-risk it and and offer them an incremental approach, I think is very is just it just it de-risks it and it lowers the bar for for adoption. Oh, definitely. I I definitely got good feedback on how close our RSX, our view macro makes it to HTML, right? So in theory, if you've, the transition should be somewhat painless, right? But, you know, it is a little bit of a different paradigm. So. Yeah. All right. Well, we are at 50 minutes. We still have two more people to get to. So unless there's anything else, Ben, I would uh, go ahead and bring Ken up. No, thank you. Let's bring him on. All right. Hey, everyone. Ken. Man, how about those? How uh, those good, how about you? Good, good. Sorry, go how about those, those benchmarks are fantastic that Ben showed. Um, the 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 back end you know three to ten x uh, more TPS by one one instance that's fantastic I think a lot of people fixate on the the front end benchmarks um, but you know a lot of folks are using JS across the entire stack so I feel like that one tells a pretty compelling narrative um, yeah um, hi I'm Ken absolutely uh, I uh, I would love to say that I set up this set for specifically for this talk. Uh, it is not the case. I actually run a YouTube channel called Code to the Moon. And we talk about um, a lot of software development topics, uh, many of which are bleeding edge. Uh, I talk a lot about Rust, talk about other things like ergonomic keyboards. And in the recent, probably, I guess, six months or so, maybe longer than that, I have focused quite a bit on Leptos. Um, and I've done a video on building a 
chatbot using Leptos across the entire you know, with Rust across the entire stack, kind of like ChatGPT, but um, you know, much more minimal. I did a video on comparing uh, Leptos and Dioxys, another video on Dioxys specifically and using Rust across the entire stack. So anyway, my point is I've uh, been covering kind of front end and full stack Rust development for a while. Um, why I'm passionate about uh, full stack development in Rust, I think Ben really touched on most of the most of the reasons. Um, you know, I could talk about server functions and actions and resources and all that, but uh, Really, I think the one of the killer features of Leptos is the community. You know, it's really nice to to be able to jump on the Discord server and uh, get you know get help pretty quickly um, and and empathetically. Uh, that said, uh, you know, Greg and the team have done a fantastic job on the Leptos book. Um, everything you need is there. That said, uh, I think some people do like to learn via video or and via you know coming up with a real world project uh, and kind of learning the concepts of the framework piecemeal as that real world project is built out. Um, so to that end, I have created a course called Full Stack Development with Rust and Leptos. And the course does just that. We take a uh, kind of minimalist blogging website and build it out piece by piece through the course. And each piece, each component that we build of the, the blogging website kind of introduces a new concept, uh, a new Leptos concept. And one of the things I wanted to do with the course was to have as few prerequisite knowledge, have as little prerequisite knowledge as possible. I would have loved to go even further and say, like, you don't even need to know Rust to, to jump into the course, but I wasn't quite able to get there. But um, really, you, you don't need to know, you need to know uh, Rust closures uh, to get started. You don't need to know any reactive programming, don't need to have any experience with React or uh, any of the front end JavaScript frameworks. So no prior uh, reactive programming knowledge is assumed. That's all explained in the course. Um, so yeah, the entire course is about an hour and a half, uh, which is hard to believe because uh, it actually took about three full days to record. The course is on uh, the LinkedIn learning platform, which is something you get as part of LinkedIn premium, which is a paid product, but uh, they offer a one month free trial which should be more than sufficient to complete the course. Um, and also once you're in that trial, I would also recommend if you're interested in uh, async programming with Rust, there's a fantastic course by uh, Marcus Willock on async programming with Tokyo. So definitely do check that out too if you are uh, if you sign up for the free trial. Um, yeah, that's uh, I, I, I would love feedback on the course. As far as I know, it's one other thing I didn't mention is it's it's also intended to be a holistic course. It's not just about Leptos. We go into uh, the SQL X crate. And so it's really about building a, a full stack Rust app from scratch uh, that happens to use Leptos and all the other crates that we introduced in the course. Um, would love feedback. Uh, as far as I know, it's the only one of its kind. I don't know of any other kind of uh, holistic course that, that uh, leverages Leptos. Um, yeah, it, it, it was funny because uh, I, I was debating whether to use Leptos in the course. I was I was had to make a Rust course, and uh, it's natural to be hesitant to use a pre 1.0 release of a framework in a course. But I talked to Greg, and he said the APIs are relatively stable, and um, you know, for a, a pre 1.0 framework, it, it feels incredibly mature. So uh, that gave me comfort in creating this course. Um, that said, if you have any feedback, I would love to hear it and potentially incorporate that into future revisions of the course. This is the first LinkedIn course that I've done, but my understanding is that there is a mechanism for uh, introducing updates. So um, once I get a bunch of feedback, I hope to be able to update the course. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's the course. Um, if anyone have any, has any questions, I'd be happy to answer those either on the course or my Leptos experience or YouTube in general. Yeah. Hardest part yeah, to sure. Choose. So yeah, again, thank yeah. absolutely. So thanks for thanks for again for joining us, Ken. So uh for those uh listening, I had I'd actually seen seen him post this. So they can you can be found on YouTube as, as Code to the Moon, correct? Code to the Moon, yeah. Yeah. Um 
And uh, I saw you posted this, and I've I've consumed actually quite a bit of your content. You just started popping up in my recommended videos, and I really enjoy your content. And um, so I was excited to reach out to you and, and have you on here. Um, so thanks for joining. And just to reiterate for anybody listening, so they can find it on LinkedIn Learning. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. Yeah, Great. if you just search for um, uh, Le Leptos, I think I'm the only one. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. Um, now, uh, we do have a couple of questions, so I'll just pop them up on the screen for you here. So the first question is, so what would you like to see um, in Leptos in the future? Yeah, um, and I guess a lot of the, the the templating system, right? Like having to use closures and kind of, there's a lot of, I guess, syntactic boilerplate. And I'm not an es expert in procedural macros, so like maybe it's not, possible to eliminate some of those things. But I think the templating and uh, integration of uh, values from the rest code into the templates, maybe there's something we can do there uh, to make it more concise. But I think in general, you know, one of the uh, things people tend to have a visceral reaction to in, in Rust in general is the verbosity, right? So anything, anything we can do to uh, reduce the verbosity is fantastic. Um, Ideally, not at the expense of clarity, right? Uh, and then, you know, one one of the issues I ran into is uh, in templating. This bit me many times that I, I think I have a potentially multiple questions about this on, on the on the uh, Leptos Discord server. But uh, you know, interpolating Rust values from the Rust code into the templates, uh, not having a um, not having it in a closure, you could potentially there, there's I forgot the exact syntax, but there's there's a way you can accidentally make the val value static and and not re uh, reactive. And so there's there's some gotchas there that I think can trip up people that are new to the framework that may, I don't know, maybe th those sorts of things can be ironed out a little bit. So um, that would be my one of my number one things. But it, it's other than that, like it's hard to come up with with a, a, a long wish list. Uh, I, I think sure. yeah. server server functions are fantastic. They just make the developer experience so so amazing um but yeah i, th I think beginner friendliness would be uh high on my list sure um so then the next question is what do you think uh what was the hardest part you know as you as you as you make this as you make this course and you think about how you're going to present this uh content you know I, I think when you're making a course a lot of the the difficulty is you know what is the natural progression of things and well i think a lot of the reasons that People take courses is not just to be told what to do and how to do it, but to, have, to basically outsource that process of of what do I learn next. Um, and so, as you as you put this course together and you thought about um, you know Leptos, what did you find to be the most challenging aspect of it? Was it was it Rust? Was it ecosystem? Was it Leptos? What was the hardest part to teach in this course? I think you touched on it. Uh, it's it's coming up with an end end goal, right? This blogging app, and then coming up with the route that you take to get there and making the route such that each concept builds on the previous concept. I found that incredibly difficult. And um, I would say that's where a majority of the time was spent in prepping for the course. So, uh, you know, starting with uh, reactive programming in general and going into signals and coming up with, with a way to with, with a mechanism for teaching signals in the form of a page on this this blogging website, and then kind of uh, ratcheting up the difficulty and building on the previous concepts, and then going into server functions. Yeah, the the order of uh, the order in which things are explained and the way those things tie into the end product is is kind of a, a web that has to be weaved uh, very carefully. Um, so yeah, th that was definitely the hardest thing for me in terms of. Like Leptos concepts that were hard to teach. Um, I don't know if there were any specific concepts. I think the the video on resources um, is is probably the longest. I'm just looking at the ta the uh, table of contents right now. Yeah, I would say resources uh, was was a little bit challenging because it, it just because it not not because resources uh, are are challenging in isolation, but it kind of builds on all the previous concepts. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's like a ten minute video, which by this course's standards is is relatively long. Each each they tell they tell you to keep each video around five minutes. Um, and in some cases, I was 
able to succeed at that and others not so much but uh but yeah th that would be the hardest part is kind of um you know coming up with that route the end goal coming up with the route that uh that is conducive to learning things in the right order got it yeah i think i found it on i've got it up here on on uh, linkedin i'm gonna post it in the uh live chat if that's okay with you sure yeah yeah so for anybody uh interested it's in the live chat um so yeah looks like that was all the questions um and i think we would jump to nico unless was there anything else that you had um that you want to discuss ken nope thank you for having me absolutely thank you for joining um it was uh it was awesome to see you um see you in the flesh not not in your youtube videos which is normally where i see you I, uh, I'm pretty sure I'm subscribed to your channel. Again, I, I really enjoy your content. So uh, it's awesome. exciting to have you on here. So thanks. Thanks again. Thank and um, yeah, if you ever put any major updates and you want to drop back in and make another announcement or, or just drop in, just feel free to hit me up. Sounds good. Thanks, Luke. All right. Thank you. All right. Up next, we have Nico. He's going to give us some updates on tailwind fuse and then as well i think leptos hotkeys um because matthew was supposed to do the update on leptos hotkeys but i think he was unable to make it um so i think you were going to do both is that right nico yep yep okay cool uh, i think we have some delay in your audio so i will rely on chat to update me as to the audio um, but yeah, Nico, if you want to, if you want to take it away, go for it. Yeah, sounds good. Let me, uh, share my screen. Okay. Does this work? Yep. Perfect. So yeah, I'm here to talk about uh, a new crate that I wrote like last month. It's called tail Fuse. But before I get there, um, I just wanted to also announce that, so Matthew and I, uh, Matthew's the author of Leptos Hockeys. We started a, a little developer collective called Gaucho Labs. And so we're putting kind of all of our work here, kind of right now it's centered on Rust libraries for the web. And so I wrote Leptos Query, Leptos Image, now Tailwind Fuse. And Matthew wrote these two. And so if anybody's like interested, or anything like you can find all of these here and yeah for, for for right now i think there's three of us that are maintaining these crates but yeah just just wanted to, to shout that out really quick and so now i can get to tail and fuse so before i um like kind of show any code or go to the the github or anything i kind of want to talk about just tailwind in general um I think it's very obvious that Tailwind has found a really cool niche just in the in the web world. Uh, it doesn't matter like what programming language you use, like if you're using like something like Python and Django or Ruby on Rails or JavaScript, like you can use Tailwind or Rust, right? But you can use Tailwind anywhere. And so that speaks to kind of like it's it's a good primitive that solves styling, um, especially when you're using components. So I think that's that's the really cool thing about Tailwind in general is that it lets you do really cool styling, especially to components. Like you don't have to rewrite your same class a bunch of times. You can encapsulate that into a component and then you don't have to rewrite it. And it's like one place for maintenance and such. And so uh, that, that's Tailwind. And so a thing that becomes really difficult when, you, when you're using Tailwind is managing conflicts. And so basically once you start writing these components and let's say like you have a button component and then you have like, it has this long tailwind class that defines all the styles for that component. Like let's say in one place you want to override something, you want to override some style property. That's very difficult, if not impossible to do without tail infused. And we'll go through kind of step-by-step step as to like why that is. And so, um, so what is Tailwind Fuse? Tailwind Fuse is the missing piece for seamless class composition and conflict resolution when using Tailwind CSS with Rust. And so this is something that like I like to use 
when I'm building, but it's not, it's not specific to leptose. It is like framework agnostic. It's just uh, like a, a macro and a function to handle these conflict resolutions. And so before we get to Tailwind 2, I want to talk about um, kind of like styles in general, like how do conflicts happen? Uh, and one, one thing that like surprised me when I learned about it was that in traditional CSS, like if you have two classes that apply the same CSS property, the or order that they're listed in the HTML actually doesn't matter at all. It's the order uh, that they're in this, like the actual style sheet. So like basically the last one, the same two cl classes applied to some some HTML element, then the last one will win. And so if we look at this, like if we have these two classes, text red, text blue, and then we have this div that has both of these classes, despite like text red being at the end and maybe like we have this intuition that maybe the last one would win in terms of overriding, that's just not how it works. The last one in the style sheet uh, wins. And so this is actually like, it causes a lot of pain because in Tailwind, like most of the time you're not writing anything in a style sheet, like that it, the Tailwind TLI kind of takes care of that for you or the like whatever build tool you're using takes care of that for you. And, and so just to showcase that, like this is kind of just like a live demo of, of that previous code. So despite, um, despite text red coming at the end because blue is first, this text is blue. So we can go back. And so this is kind of where Tailwind Fuse kind of steps in uh, because it helps you just manage conflicts and create like reusable components with this, this uh, idea of overriding styles with this capability that it, it's not possible to do otherwise. And so in, in Tailwind Fuse, there's basically two operations. One is just joining and then the other one is merging. And so the main difference here is that joining doesn't do any conflict resolution. So computationally, it's more, it's cheaper. So if you, if you know that you're in a case where you're just joining stuff and you don't want to have to write like format or any of the other macros for concatenating strings, like this is just a nice way to do that. And so the library does give you that. Um, um, but we also have this thing tail and merge. And so kind of just the, the main idea here is you can have a bunch of class names and then it will look at them and the rightmost one will always win. And so if we have these two padding classes, padding four and padding two, because padding four is on the right, padding four wins, overrides padding two and you only get back padding. And what's also cool about this is that you can do like more complex things like refinements. And so let's say you want everything to be padding four, uh, but, but you want on the Y, you want a different padding. So you want padding PY two. Um, this could also be like PT uh, for top or PB for bottom. That will that will just and and it won't ne like necessarily knock it out. It will keep both of them. And these collisions, like though it looks trivial, it, it is pretty complicated. There's a lot of tailwind classes, a lot of like attributes that you can specify, and so this is just like a, a moderately complicated one uh, being. They both start with stroke, but according to the tailwind specification, like this is a number. And so given that it's a number, this is the stroke width property. And then this one is the stroke color property. And so given that they're both different like properties for CSS, like when you merge them, nothing happens. And then this is also, uh, this also supports like all the prefixes that you can use in tailwind, like large, hover, group, those sorts of things. And uh, given that there's a different modifier here, like it, there's no no knockout happens. They're like kind of like different namespaces with the modifiers. And then this is kind of what I was speaking to before, like kind of before something like Tailwind merge, like you always, let's say you're running a bunch of different classes, like you always have to write kind of this ugly format code again and again and again um, to to concatenate strings. And so now that I've kind of gone through all of those things, I can go to, I briefly want to speak about the inspiration about this crate. Um, one of the, in, like in the React world, uh, this, that's kind of what I did before I started using Leptos a lot. 
uh, there's this uh, crate called Shad CN, Shad CN UI, and it kind of uh, revolutionized components in, in the React world where uh, the, the paradigm shifted where instead of components being kind of a library that you add, and then like you can use kind of the, the hooks that the library gives you to build your components and customize them. Uh, in Shad CN, this is like they're, they're components that you just put into your code base. So, and then you own them. So you have absolute control over everything that you want to do in your components. And so in, in doing that, you also have, this is built on like tail and first. And so in order to do like custom styling and overriding and all these sorts of things, uh, you did need a merge primitive. Like without that, something like building something like Shad CN is not possible in Leptos. And so that, that was kind of the main inspiration. And I want to show like, what exactly is possible now like with this fuse um with this fuse crate and so i talked about just like the merging utility so far um and so there's basically two parts of the crate one is just the merge and that's that's useful because like that's a hard problem to solve if, if you don't have a library um but the second is this idea of building your own tailwind variants and that's done like with a, with an attribute macro, and uh, this is an example of like what you can build in your own code first components using leptos and tailwind merge. I mean tailwind fuse. So these are uh, actually I think it might be best to start with the code here. So we have a a struct here called button class, and button class has this this pretty long class this is kind of like what is common properties across all buttons what are common classes across all buttons and then we have two things that we kind of want to be able to customize the variant here which is kind of like the color so if we scroll all the way back here like the destructive outline ghost link default secondary those are all variants and then and those size would be like square small default whatever and so kind of using this pattern here of you create a a, a structure that enumerate not enumerates but has contains all the fields for all of the different like customizable properties of your class and then you have for each of these ones you have an enum kind of signaling these are kind of all of the the, the types that i have all the types of buttons that i have or all the sizes of buttons that i have you can then create a like a tailwind first uh, Leptos button component here that has full style overriding on a case by case basis that you can always override. And I, I kind of want to show like what, how cool that is. Um, so for one, like each of the, like the size and the variant, those are both, uh, variant properties, like variant types with a variant macro. And so you can make these like optionals, um, because each of the variants have a default and then you can have an override class. Here. And so basically what you do is you, you create, you instantiate a, a button class, you call with class, with your override class, and then you have a perfectly no conflict tailwind class that you can use to style your button. And so it, it lets you do super easy, like to, to build something like this in really short amount of lines, and you can override it in any case. So one, this is a default one, a large one, and then this is a custom one. And so if we look at uh, what the code looks like for this, um, sorry. So this is kind of what the code looks like. So you just say size, you override the size here. This one's default, so you don't have to give it anything. This one is large, this one is icon. And then like, let's say if you don't give a size, it'll be default. And then I just want to put like a custom override. So this goes, um, into the the button size the button size normal one is, is the default has all of these properties i override the height and the width and so that this height gets knocked out and then you have you keep the padding you keep the the padding x you keep the padding y and then you just get kind of that knocked out like those those overridden height and width styles and so this enables you to to write really concise components in your leptos code and uh 
and it's like it's a very it's a very beautiful system i think um it's specifically like now that now that your your styles are only strings you can actually apply them to any type of element so that's another thing that's really cool so if you look at like this link type like you hover it under your lines and it also has some like sizing properties but if i want to take this tailwind string and apply it to a different element type like for instance let's say an href i mean an anchor uh you can you can do that too um so if we look here uh we have an a an a tag with with gaucho labs and then for the class for the tailwind class i just do button class variant size variant to class and that gives me my tailwind string and i can kind of take this take this tailwind class and apply it to any type of element that i want so I kind of jumped all over the place, but I, I, that, that's, that's kind of the essence of the, of the crate. And yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are some bugs, like it has a lot of tests and stuff, but I'm sure there are edge cases I didn't consider. So if anybody finds something like, just let me know, I'll, I'll be sure to jump on it and fix it. But I think it works really well. Uh, I've used it in kind of all of my projects from now, from now. Um, and yeah, that, that's, that's kind of what I have to show. Very cool, man. That is very cool. Yeah, I think anybody, anybody who's done, you know, any significant amount of UI development, particularly with Tailwind, has probably run into that. And anybody who's done CSS has run into, yeah, all kinds of things with order and specificity and <laughs> all these kinds of things and trying to figure out why Flexbox doesn't work, which is one of the secrets of the universe that still has yet to be decoded, I think. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, that's that's really cool, Nico. Um, and um, yeah, if anybody has any questions on that, please be sure to put it in the chat. Um, I'll keep an eye out for questions if you want to move on to uh, the update on hotkeys, left those, left those hotkeys, unless you had anything else uh, for Tailwind Fuse. Nope, I don't, I don't have anything else. But so okay. yeah, I can quickly jump to to hotkeys. So basically, I think uh, Matthew, you, um, this other guy, Mondeja, they've been doing a, a bunch of stuff, just like kind of making some backwards incompatible changes, and they're looking to release a, a 0 0.2. And so they've done two alphas, but uh, just want to like uh, show that this is something that's in progress. Like they're looking for feedback if there's anything that you guys like that a user of this doesn't agree with they're 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 willing to have some feedback on that and uh it's just a lot of refinements i think overall like there was there were some unnecessary config like uh feature flags like compile features that weren't used and uh i think this also made it fully complete nightly and stable and then i think it just like overall some refinements to the api um like for one, like providing kind of the context, I think instead of like a component wrapper, they just do like provide hotkeys context uh, via a function, um, kind of like a React brain type of thing originally and that making it more refined, leptus way of doing things. So uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it, I think for hotkeys. Right on. Awesome. Yeah, we uh, we don't have any questions, but we do have some positive feedback uh, about Tailwind Fuse. Apparently, people are loving it. So um, that is super cool, man. You've got some great feedback there, and I uh, appreciate all the work. So, um, Okay, yeah, cool. You. Then, yeah, I think then, I think that does it for this month. Um, anybody, if anybody has any questions, put them in the chat now or forever hold your peace. Uh, Nico, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we love hearing y'all's updates uh, each month. It's super exciting to see the work that y'all are doing. Um, and in Gaucho Labs, you, you said this is like a development collective. Did I catch that correctly? Yep. Cool. Right on. That's awesome. That's very cool, man. Um, well, yeah, you know, we, we love to see the updates you guys are pushing out. Y'all are super productive and we've, everyone I think very much appreciates that. So thank you so much. Um, okay. Then Nico, thanks yeah, so no much. Problem. And My hopefully pleasure. we see you. Yeah. Hopefully we see you in discord afterwards. Um, so thank you everybody for joining the March Leptos meetup. 
Uh, as always, we will be in Discord having the Discord meetup after party. Usually there's a lively voice chat going on and people just having a lot of interesting discussions on software development in general, Rust, front end development, back end development, Leptos, you name it. So come join us there. Uh, go to leptos.dev uh, uh, leptos and you can find the link to get, uh, Discord there. Uh, or you can just look at the description for the meetup video, and it's there as well. So, again, for myself and everybody else, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you in April on the last Saturday of April at 8 p.m. Central European time, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Actually, I think with the time change, that might change. I think it's it'll always be 3 p.m. 3 p.m. Eastern time. We'll say that. 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, last Saturday of every month. Thanks, and we look forward to seeing you in April.